Lovely to be with you today. I just uh, wanted to thank Jim and Jim Bold and Peter and Roger and the others who have spoken before me. Some really interesting stories, uh, some valuable uh, insights too. So uh, we're all getting a chance to learn as we go. Uh, as you probably already picked from my accent, I'm not a native of New Zealand. I'm originally from Detroit. Uh, no earthquake risks in Detroit. No, Drive-by shootings are more the problem there. <laughs> I, I, I've been, the Resilient Organizations Research Group's been going uh, for the last eight years. Uh, I was founded by Erica Seville, and I've been working with her for most of that time in the research program. But it's not just at the University of Canterbury, although we're, uh, that is our home base, uh, for which we're grateful. But we're part of the Natural Hazards Platform, which is funded through MSI. And we've got researchers at the University of Auckland and various other places around the uh, country, and uh, including, including some of our colleagues, some of our uh, team uh, are here this morning, from, mostly from the University of Canterbury. So uh, uh, the, other, the others mostly have spoken about uh, larger organizations. Uh, my cases and my example is going to be uh, about the SMEs. Uh, someone, I forget who it was, might have been Roger, uh, commented that uh, the New Zealand economy uh, sits quite strongly upon uh, uh, the SMEs. They make up the mass of our organizations. Before I get into that, though, I wanted to set the stage just a little bit. So some of the things that I'll be talking about, uh, what, what do we mean by recovery? Different people mean different things. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, why I think resilience is important in the face of that. Uh, in many cases, I'm not telling you anything new. Uh, there are things that you're already aware of and some of our previous speakers spoke of, so maybe just putting a few uh, bit of flesh on the, on the bones in some cases. Uh, I'll talk briefly about leadership as a key enabler for uh, the other resilience characteristics uh, that I'll introduce you to. And then talk about three cases of resilient businesses uh, who face different challenges. Uh, the resilient organizations, our, our resilience model, if you like, that we've uh, developed over these uh, last eight years, you, you think something as simple as this, uh, we would have gotten to a little quicker than eight years, uh, but it's taken us a little while to unpick what this thing means. Our definition, quite simply, is the ability of an organization to survive a crisis, a disaster, catastrophe, and to thrive in the midst of uncertainty. And uh, we're facing a lot of uncertainty in Christchurch right now of all kinds. Uh, another key part that's not embedded in our definition, but you'll hear me repeat over and over again, is the ability to find the silver lining. Uh, it, it isn't just about the survival part or getting back to business as usual, but it's finding those opportunities that often only present themselves in a crisis. Uh, the, the ability of an organization to change only when there's real trouble uh, because the momentum of day to day often prevents the kinds of changes we sometimes do need. So uh, although uh, it, it can be very difficult, it also presents opportunities for change of uh, quite a beneficial nature for organization. So what does our model look like? Well, it, it's got two, two main elements to it, if you like, two main dimensions, an adaptive dimension and a planning dimension. And we've heard quite a lot about the planning dimension this morning, and it tends to be stronger in larger organizations. Small organizations tend to not be uh, very well planned, although that does vary. Uh, and you can see we've got 13 characteristics uh, that, that we're concerned with, uh, measures uh, that can tell us something about how resilient an organization is. Uh, we'll come back and talk a little bit about some of these uh, further. The second thing I wanted to talk briefly about is economic recovery from disaster. Uh, lots of people have different definitions, so I thought I'd give you some focus on what I'm meaning by recovery, uh, because we're, that's, that's what we're in the middle of. Or at least we start to get into the middle of it, and then something else happens, and we find ourselves rewinding, in some cases, uh, back to the beginning. So briefly, recovery of an economy and recovery of individual businesses. Uh, I, I, my, my thanks to Professor Maki from uh, Kyoto University. Uh, uh, I was at a workshop with him in Wellington recently. And these three, three graphs come from him, uh, from the work that they've been doing post Kobe and uh, in the earthquakes in Japan. Uh, so from a big picture standpoint, let's say the event, the Christchurch, uh, say the 22nd of February uh, event. One of the diagrams talks about what happens immediately after. Uh, and that's this one here where you get an immediate slump followed by recovery pretty much back to where you were uh, before, just depending on how bad the damage was and whether you've lost much population. So retail sales is an example of that. Uh, a second diagram describes what's coming and it hasn't quite started yet, 
Uh, although in some sectors, perhaps it's already happening, and that's the boom in the following slump. Uh, so the rebuild of Christchurch will follow this. How long the, the first hump will be and how long the slump will be uh, is something we'd like to try to manage, uh, but how well managed it will be is hard to say. Some of, those, some of the things that will help us manage it may be outside of our control. And the third one is uh, a, a slump and without a recovery, or at least not with a full recovery. Uh, and that may be the case with some industries. Certainly they found that in Kobe. Uh, there were a number of heavy industries, manufacturing, that didn't recover. Uh, the work went elsewhere. Uh, other industries came in, and the city is still a vibrant city. It has, has recovered uh, to, by whatever defin definition you'd like to use. One of the things that this, these three di diagrams describe for us, though, is that different organizations uh, have had different impacts and their recovery is going to look differently. Uh, so that's, th th from an economy as a whole standpoint, you might look at it that way. From an individual organization standpoint, you could look at it by comparing the type of recovery with the type of event. And so from a recovery standpoint, you might, you might survive, but not thrive. And so you're in decline. You've survived the crisis, but your business is in a slump and it's maybe will never recover back to where it was. You might have a full recovery pretty much back to where you were before uh, you've survived. But you may still not be thriving. It may be business as usual, but you're faking it most of the time. Uh, uh, bounce back is, is the style where you've, you've survived and yeah, there's some thriving going on there. You're finding new opportunities, new ways of doing business. And we've heard some of those this morning already. And bounce forward is where you've probably reformed quite a lot in the way you conduct your business. Not only just to survive, but because you saw new opportunities that you could leverage up off of. And uh, we'll have some examples from our case studies. Type of event. Could be a crisis or an emergency, a disaster, and this is an escalating order, or a catastrophe. Most of Christchurch probably falls into the disaster category, but there's lots of businesses and individuals that are really in a crisis or emergency, and some of them didn't even get into that space. Uh, there are some parts of town didn't lose power, didn't lose water, really didn't lose much of anything. Uh, does that mean they were unaffected? No, because they may have known someone who was killed. Uh, their employer may have been badly uh, damaged. Uh, and so they had to work from home. So there may have still been uh, significant impacts. Uh, but right across Christchurch, there are organizations and individuals that would fall into any of the cells in this uh, little simple chart. Uh, clearly, the, most, the least resilient is going to tend to fall into this category, assuming that they did survive. Otherwise, they wouldn't appear on here at all. And the most resilient would be those who really did face a catastrophe, meaning that they could not possibly have survived without external help. They couldn't get themselves back up off the ground. But the most resilient will bounce forward rather than just being thankful for having survived. They'll be looking for fresh ways to do business. So uh, given, given that uh, background, uh, a key factor in our resilience model, and one of, the, one of the, uh, the, the characteristic that I think stands out from the rest, and it's the one that enables the rest of the characteristics, these other, the other 12, if you like, on this model, is the leadership characteristic. And that's been mentioned a number of times this morning. Uh, I guess if I had to choose between an outstanding emergency plan, and we had a number of plans described to us this morning, and some worked really well, and others worked okay, uh, if I had to choose between having an outstanding emergency plan and having an outstanding leader, uh, I, I can tell you absolutely which one I would choose. Uh, because the, leader, the, the emergency plan often doesn't fit what you thought was going to happen. Uh, sometimes that's okay. You can still work through it. Uh, other times it just leaves you in a bit of a mess. If you've got good leadership, it won't matter. Uh, they can work, they'll, they'll work their way through it uh, just the same. If you've got poor leadership, uh, everything turns to custard, doesn't it? So uh, leadership, yes, but not all leadership is equal, I guess is how I would describe it. Uh, and so I'd like to talk very briefly about uh, what, what you might term virtuous leadership, which makes the difference between somebody who's a good leader under business as usual, but they may or may not be that effective uh, in a crisis. Of course, that could apply equally to, uh, to business as usual. Uh, uh, there was a man named Ron Heifetz, you can see I've got the footnote at the bottom, wrote a book called Leadership Without Easy Answers, and I'm paraphrasing him here, but he says this kind of leadership, great leadership, which has uh, virtuous underpinnings to it, has the ability to mobilize the leader that's in each one of us, that's in each one of your employees, that's in each one of your neighbors, uh, because everyone's a leader someplace. 
Uh, they may be a leader in a club, they may be a leader in their family, maybe in their business, and maybe someplace in their community, in their church, or some, some other way. And a great leader's got the ability to mobilize that energy uh, and, and get things done that are impossible. And we've had examples of that described to us from Sam Johnson's mobilization of the Student Volunteer Army to organizations whose people stepped up and accomplished the impossible. Andrew's example with uh, Telstra Clear might fall into that. So the ability to mobilize the leader and everyone and maximize, therefore, maximize the adaptability of the organization. Because if everyone's leading, they're all looking for solutions. They're all looking for ways to make things happen within the, their organization. We see this virtue coming various ways. So here we have the Christchurch uh, uh, city uh, emblem. I, I've highlighted the last piece because it's a piece I think is so important for our city and no news to many of you. You've seen this before, that Christchurch needs to hearken not only uh, to its future, but also think a bit about its past, and uh, strong in the hope for the future. So we've got a foundation, and this one was written a long time ago. Or you might have uh, a Sam in the uh, love, love Canterbury, Love Christchurch uh, uh, campaign, which I think is fantastic. Uh, so uh, hope and love coming through there. So when, so when I say virtue, uh, I guess part of the problem we face is that over the last 20 or 30 years, we've tended to forget about this and tended to focus more on success, uh, bottom line, bonuses of senior executives, uh, knowledge management, uh, and we've forgotten perhaps sometimes about courage or uh, wisdom, about faith uh, and uh, justice, uh, which is an important feature in the recovery of Christchurch in so many ways. Moderation, not thinking we all know everything, but being willing to listen to others and moderate both our approach so that others can be part of the solution. Uh, wisdom uh, is, is at least as important as effective knowledge, uh, but sometimes we've forgotten that as well. And that caring, which we have seen so much of in Christchurch. Uh, I'm not telling you these things because I think it's missing completely in Christchurch. Uh, in fact, I've seen so much of the, this virtue coming through uh, in self-sacrifice, stepping up through courage, the, the desire for justice and the need for it, uh, people demonstrating their care encouraging hope and having faith in one another. And these, so these things uh, are potent, uh, but somewhat sometimes a bit forgotten. So I'd like to talk about three cases that bring some of these elements together. These are all SMEs, all with uh, less than 40 employees, mostly in the 2015, probably be the smallest one, 15 to 40 employees. First one's a panel beater. Uh, this this uh, particular panel beater was quite a successful small business. They had between 30 and 40 employees. They had three different locations in Christchurch. Uh, after the 4th of September, however, they lost one of their locations. Uh, the employer uh, didn't want to shed any of his staff, so they figured he figured out a way of getting everybody into the two locations, uh, which, was, which was terrific. Unfortunately, after the 22nd of February, he lost another location, so he's down to one, and uh, he was in real strife because there was no way he was gonna get 40 people, 30 or 40 people into that one location. What he did, I thought, required quite significant wisdom. He sat down with his staff, uh, and some of you would do this, you have this wisdom. He sat down with his staff and said, we've got a real problem. I wanna keep you all on, we wanna service our customers, but I don't know how we're gonna do that in this single space. Help me think about that, and he did. And they came up with a most wonderful solution. What they did was they moved to multiple shifts, nothing new there. Uh, they, re they rejigged the way they ran